Welcome to everyone who has come to listen to the lecture series Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities, organized by Mobility Lab University of Tartu. Today is the last lecture of this year lecture series, and we have had seven interesting lectures by mobility and transport planning experts and leading researchers from Estonia, Finland and the United States of America. Uh, today's lecture is given by Karl Seidler, uh, who is a postdoctoral researcher in Mobility Lab, University of Tartu. Uh, his research compares the bike share system of Tartu and Helsinki from the perspective of uh, poli public policy. And he is interested uh, what governmental approaches are most likely to help sustain and grow active transportation rates. And the title of Kara's uh, lecture today is Active Transportation Policy, What, Why and How. And if you have any questions during the lecture, please uh, write this to the Q&A section and we will read them during the discussion part. And now I will give the floor to Karl. Uh, okay, yes, so very pleased to be here and talking about one of my favorite topics active transportation, Mr. Um, Elton, uh, Mix, yeah, uh, uh, This is the outline of what we'll talk about today. Uh, yes, what, uh, why, and uh, how, how from a, a policy perspective, and also uh, how a little bit from a political perspective as well. Uh, so quickly, what is active transportation? Uh, I think we think of it as, as being relatively intuitive. Uh, it's using your own power to get from one place to another for practical purposes. Usually walking and cycling, but it can be, of course, these other modes as well. And it's often used in combination with public transport. So I, I uh, use the terms active and sustainable transportation a bit interchangeably. And overall, the idea is that these represent a, a unified alternative to automobile use. And I want to say quickly that I think the, the beauty of this idea or the elegance of the idea is that it's really accomplishing a lot of very useful societal objectives, uh, all to effectively one, uh, one approach that, uh, that happens ideally in the yeah, course of daily life. Uh, Noiga kord, et on, mul on uh, Eesti foto, ma pean natuke Eesti keelt räägima. No uh, siin ma näen, et uh, targad inimesed kasutavad, kasutavad uh, raamatukogus ja kasutavad ka mobiile transport. Um, the advantages uh, mainly follow these categories and we'll talk about each one. Health, environment, social and economic. At least this is the way I've, I've classified it myself, but I think that's a pretty obvious classification. So from a health point of view, uh, this promotion of active transportation is supported by virtually all the major uh, national and international health organizations. There's unanimous agreement that this is a good idea from a health perspective. Uh, noting that physical inactivity is the world's uh, fourth leading risk factor for death. Uh, and in Estonia, uh, from somewhere or other, I found out that the number of adults meeting the, the WHO activity guidelines is uh, quite low and adolescents even less. So we have that problem here just about like we have it everywhere else. The idea, of course, is that if we increase rates of active transportation, then it will increase physical activity and we'll get improved health outcomes. Uh, this I, I always like to show because it's one of the papers that first uh, got me interested in active transportation. And uh, it doesn't show causality, but it shows this relationship between uh, countries that are strong in active transportation, uh, between active transportation uh, rates basically and obesity. And we see this general pattern whereby the countries with higher rates of active transportation have lower rates of obesity. Um, Anyway, I found that, found that persuasive myself, even though it's not, a, you know, it's not showing causality, but there's thought provoking in the early years. Uh, more recently, we have all kinds of studies showing these uh, health benefits related to active transportation. I've picked one here. Uh, 
it's uh, associations between active commuting and cardiovascular disease and cancer. And then we see it's quite uh, impressive, uh, impressive results. Another angle that it's important from is uh, with respect to air pollution. We know that uh, air pollution, breathing polluted air, that's the fifth leading uh, risk factor for death in the world. Um, and uh, the idea is that by having less cars on the road, we can reduce uh, the air pollution and uh, this will save lives. And where I'm from, I'm not from the Toronto area, but I'm from Canada. And in the greater Toronto uh, Hamilton area, which is a population of about 7 million people, the uh, chief medical officers of health calculated that if, they were to, if, if the city were able to increase walking, cycling, and transit use uh, by the amounts on the screen here, then you could prevent these numbers of deaths and hospitalizations uniquely because of the reductions in exposure to polluted air. So that's not counting the physical activity benefits, that's from reducing exposure to polluted, polluted air. Uh, next to the issue of road safety. Uh, we have uh, traffic crash deaths representing the eighth leading uh, cause of death in the world. And some statistics that I've uh, attached in Estonia there. And the point that I'm, main point I'm going to try to emphasize here is that these uh, road fatalities and injuries, whether you're in a car or whether you're in a bike, but these are preventable. These are preventable for policies that we, we know about. Uh, and very important uh, in our understanding of this is uh, the relationship between speed and safety. And this is a very classic, uh, classic image from uh, Edo Plaza in Finland, uh, showing quite simply that as the speed of an automobile increases, uh, the uh, chances of survival for a pedestrian decrease exponentially. The more we can slow vehicle speeds, the more we can improve uh, traffic safety. Uh, the point of uh, this next slide is to show that, that there's also a question of infrastructure. There's a vehicle speed, but there's also a question of what type of road infrastructure we provide. And the example here uh, in the study of 13 US cities, uh, protected bike lanes were associated with stronger overall road safety records. In other words, adding protected bike lanes to cities can improve road safety for all road users. Uh, and uh, quite substantial. And then this one, uh, the point is that um, that as you're able to improve conditions for active modes, and in this case, it's for recycling, as you have more of these users on the street, you tend to have better safety because essentially they're essentially there are more visible part of more visible uh, uh, and well understood part of the traffic. And so here we see on the x axis a uh, number of countries according to average exposure of the person recycling. In other words, the number of kilometers that people cycle on average in those countries uh, versus the uh, fatality rate of cycling. And overall, uh, quite clear the pattern whereby as you have more exposure, you have uh, lower fatality, um, lower fatality rates. Um, moving to the environment, uh, noting that well, obviously, if you if you can have less cars on the road and more people walking, cycling, and using transit, then you get uh, lower GHG emissions. Um, that that part, lower GHG and other forms of harmful carbon uh, emissions, that part is relatively obvious. But sometimes we don't think about these other benefits. But if we reduce the need for car ownership, then we can reduce the environmental consequences of uh, car production. It also reduces the need for roads and parking, uh, which means, among other things, that we preserve land for more efficient use, uh, green space, housing, and so on. And uh, at least indirectly, it encourages more compact urban development. So you have kind of a virtuous circle, which as you have more people walking and cycling, well, then there's more people who want uh, a city that's more compact and less spread out, uh, and you may get tighter urban development, which is better for a number of respective environments. This is a slide in Canada showing uh, transportation greenhouse gas emissions, uh, just for, to give people an idea of the scale of the possibility. So this is all emissions from transportation. Transportation is responsible for about a quarter of 
uh, overall GHT emissions in Canada. So you have basically here an image of the quarter of GHT emissions that are related to a uh, quarter of GHT emissions that is created by transport. And then in the dark blue at the bottom, those are your typical uh, passenger light trucks, passenger cars, the area where we have room to uh, turn those into active transportation trips. Uh, and you can see it's quite big. It's just under half of that transportation emissions in Canada that are from passenger cars and trucks. Uh, so opportunity to make it to make it just really there. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting study that I came across several, it's fairly old now, but it's still, I think, uh, persuasive and, and uh, worth thinking about. Um, essentially, essentially what they did was they looked at uh, leading, leading urban areas uh, in terms of what rates they had for cycling, walking, and active transportation. And then we calculated what would happen if other comparable cities were able to uh, achieve those same rates. In other words, if the lower ranking cities were able to come up to the level of the higher ranking cities, what would this mean uh, environmentally over time? And you don't want to use my red pointer. Um, what they found was basically in 2050, this is the business as usual scenario. This is how much emissions you would have if you know, nothing really changes in terms of our existing policy. And then this is what the emissions would be if you were able to get what they consider to be a realistic shift in favor of, in favor of walk cycling and transit. So uh, they called, I think they said it was a 47% reduction over the business with usual scenario. This, this is from, from the point of view of the study, that's what's realistically possible. Uh, from a social point of view, um, you have a number of benefits, increased interaction uh, in public space, more equitable distribution of public space, um, disadvantaged groups that uh, most obviously people that don't own cars, uh, for whatever reason, they benefit from improved active transportation, uh, and you get more equitable access to amenities and resources, healthy food, health services, recreation, and so on. Uh, I like this, this concept. This is essentially what I just said, this, uh, this idea that, well, I didn't just say that, but anyway, it's, it, the idea is that, that, that philosophically, when we're planning transportation, we should be thinking that it, it serves all citizens equally, whether they drive a car or not. Um, you should be able to get around your own city, uh, access the things you need to do comfortably and conveniently. So I, like, I like that idea. Um, this shows, for example, on the issue of space, that there's a there's a sort of equity consideration here in the cars. If you if you consider them as they're traveling like as a car, they use up uh, much more space. You see over here on the right, this is how much these solo driving, how much public space it uses up compared to walking, cycling, and transit. And you could ask yourself whether is it is it really fair that that much public space is occupied uniquely by the people who are driving. Uh, meanwhile, um, the United States, anyway, uh, somewhat not surprisingly, rates of walking and cycling uh, are higher among the lowest income groups. I think that's self explanatory. If you don't have enough income to buy a car, you just walk and bike and walk. Uh, but then, on the other hand, um, it's lower income groups. Uh, it's part of the part of function of the fact that there are more of them. Uh, they're twice as likely, uh, low income people, twice as likely to be killed while walking. Then we see visual minority groups, uh, children, much more likely to be killed while walking. Yeah. Uh, from an economic point of view, I showed this slide first, <laughs> basically a list of all the areas of benefits related to active transportation, uh, it's compiled by a Canadian researcher named Todd Littman. And then uh, all the categories of costs. And you can see that if you start uh, attaching dollar values to these categories that you can do, and you add them all up, uh, more or less goes without saying that investing in active transportation is a smart choice. And well, further slide will show the, that, that that turns out to be true. 
Uh, this is actually the same uh, study I was looking about earlier with respect to uh, air pollution this is in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Uh, this is what was calculated in terms of economic benefits. Uh, so you have uh, you know, what, they, what they think should be targets for increasing active and sustainable classification rates, and then what the actual uh, uh, savings are associated with uh, health and reduced congestion charges per year by 2031. Uh, numbers, obviously. Another way of expressing it uh, is like this. I thought this graphic illustrates it pretty well. It's done for uh, the city of Vancouver. Uh, very quickly, it's, it's just saying that when you when you attach the they call the uh, full cost accounting, you attach dollar values to benefits like reductions in environmental pollution or uh, having to listen to less noise when you. You consider that, then you know what society pays for your transportation choices uh, is a lot lower if you're walking, cycling, or using transit than if you're driving. So now, how um, how in terms of policy options? I think I said earlier that you can know, allude to the fact that, that some of these these things can be changed. It's, you know, it's not a matter of uh, humans need to drive cars. And, there's a way that things can be organized so that we choose something else. Uh, so we'll talk about what some of the uh, options are for governments, what they can do, what's shown to be problems. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, one of my academic heroes, so to speak, uh, an American researcher, uh, John Couchet. And uh, he's done all kinds of comparative studies uh, comparing the policies of European countries, like particularly Denmark, uh, Germany, and the Netherlands, with North America, and then comparing that to things like mortality rates as well as active transportation rates. And then uh, his conclusion is that that uh, the, the current urban transportation systems are that's sort of he's making an obvious point that yeah, these transportation systems and the most travel they encourage. They are the result of conscious public policy decisions. Um, so transportation planning, uh, even more in North America than here, but since the Second World War, it's more or less looked, more or less looked like this. The automobile uh, generally was the, the focus with everything else kind of working around it. And you have this, uh, this well-known uh, way of, of, general way of thinking about traffic planning being what's called predict and provide approach. Uh, so you go in there, you say, well, the city's growing. Uh, we anticipate that that's going to lead to this many more uh, people trying to drive in their cars from the suburb to the center. And that means that we need to provide enough space and, and uh, you know, enough lanes of traffic and enough parking space to accommodate all those cars. And it's not a good idea because it leads to Environments like this, which are this is on a kind of industrial area underneath the outskirts of Ottawa, I picked a photo to be provocative. It's pretty ugly. But eventually, people realized that these weren't the right questions to ask because if you uh, if you if you do it that way, we ask, well, how much how much do we expect people to drive, and then you provide capacity to do it. Well, then that many people, of course, will drive, uh, and eventually. Uh, Shift think, thinking starts to shift, and the idea is what they call uh, transportation demand management, which is the realization, more or less, that we can influence uh, the relative portions of uh, different types of transport on a road through the policy choices we make. Um, one of the ways this can be done is through uh, this policy approach that you may have, may have heard of called Vision Zero. And uh, the idea is the main idea is basically you're uh, first you recognize that that traffic fatalities, uh, traffic injuries, that these are preventable. Uh, second, you decide that, uh, that that this is preventable and it takes a certain amount of investment, but it's worth it. Uh, you set a target of uh, basically of basically eliminating those fatalities. And then you assume in your planning of infrastructure that, that human beings and traffic will make mistakes. And you build your infrastructure such that when those mistakes happen, it doesn't lead to a fatality or a catastrophic injury. Uh, 
Um, here, um, uh, what I want to show is that that policy countries and jurisdictions that that have started deliberately to impl impl implement these kind of approaches uh, have had success. And so we see here with my same author and another uh, famous uh, scholar named Bueller. Uh, they show the differences not in absolute uh, numbers of uh, of deaths, but this is showing the drop in the numbers of deaths over years between different countries. So uh, I think the absolute numbers you see a similar kind of absolute numbers in the USA way higher than basically the Netherlands, Germany. Uh, but furthermore, uh, the drop between 1990 and today has been stronger in those countries. Uh, where there's been a more deliberate, uh, conscientious approach to actually uh, to make progress. They decide to make progress and they did. Um, second, and maybe a bit more specifically, uh, we need infrastructure that supports safe travel. Um, this is uh, from a Canadian organization that I'm sometimes in touch with. And uh, yeah, it's just showing simply the difference between uh, facilities that are suitable for what they call it all ages and abilities uh, facilities, something that can be used by everyone uh, for cycling, and something that uh, is maybe cycling infrastructure, but not not really doesn't meet an all ages and abilities threshold. Basically, uh, to get to an all ages ability standard, you need more separation from traffic. Um, pretty much as simple as that. Um, so yeah, this is an example of that sort of study that I was talking about earlier. But it's view the, the review countries that have done well in terms of active transportation, and review well, what kind of policies did they did they implement that appear key in explaining their high rates of active transportation and their high safety rates. And these are the kinds of things they find, and I've highlighted uh, the top three: they're having physically separated, connected, well-maintained cycling infrastructure. This for cycling only. Uh, safe intersections and traffic. So this fits with everything that we talked about before. Uh, yeah, so you need facilities uh, that look something like this: There's separate space for walking and pedestrians. And you know, the ideal scenario, you're not anywhere near any cars, and it's very pleasant, it's very convenient, and uh, no one is likely to get killed. Yeah, see, next, God, may long in the middle was the same. Uh, it's nice to uh, organize it, but uh, uh, stay on the wheels. Um, land use. Land use is also important. We have, we know that distances that people are typically willing, willing to walk and bike are about 1,000 meters for walking and 5 kilometers plus or minus for cycling. You plan a city such as, such as the distance that the people need to reach are beyond those, then it becomes very hard to get people to use active modes. Um, so it means that the more your more community is compact, in other words, where distances are not far uh, to the amenities, facilities, uh, services that you need to reach, the better it is for active transportation. This is something that I think explains, or you know, in a visual way, uh, explains what the sort of difference is in urban planning can mean from a distance-based approach. So essentially in the, the diagram on the left, what they've done is they've gone from that star and colored it in everywhere and you can potentially get uh, in a mile, uh, which is about 1,600 meters, um, in, a, in a neighborhood that has a tight sort of grid pattern type layout, which is considered to be a very good way of uh, organizing a city from an active transportation point of view versus uh, a sort of typical cul-de-sac style uh, suburb that you might find in the outskirts of uh, all kinds of North American cities. And it also be how far you can go uh, one mile. And you can picture what kind of environment this is. The environment on the right, basically, there's nothing but houses. In a mile, you can walk around a bunch of curvilinear streets and you can see other houses. That's it. In a mile here, you can probably do virtually everything you need uh, for your day of the month. Um, 
for land use, well, what does that mean in terms of actual policy? Uh, I can't talk about all of these things in detail, but essentially one thing you need is the governments uh, need to be committed to it and they need to have the ability to influence how development happens, how cities are organized, where things can go. They can do things from, you know, as strong as buying land and real estate and then having complete control over it, or they can pass bylaws, incentive policy, and so on. Uh, you need stronger efforts of coordinating between different levels of government. Because, for example, like in Buffalo, you have the city of Buffalo, which is responsible for this area that's quite urban. Uh, and it can be doing all kinds of good things. But if the neighboring municipalities on the outside of the building uh, sprawl apart from the center that's uh, car oriented, then uh, we will have, have trouble with this traffic. Um, you need uh, development that's concert, concentrated around uh, transit hubs where you have them. Uh, there's the idea of 15 minute neighborhoods, which in simple terms uh, means the kind of neighborhood where you can access uh, all the things you need to access uh, on a daily basis by a 15 minute walk. You can limit urban boundary expansion. This is the thing that happens commonly in Canada. That all the city is, you know, supposed to be built in the middle of this, and then they apply to a higher level of government to say, well, we need more space. Like, Widen the area and they fill it with low end capital. Um, yeah, I think that's all we need to say about that. Um, this is the kind of uh, from Copenhagen. Uh, I think this would be an example of the sort of thing you would typically see in a 15 minute style city. It's dense, you can imagine living there, accessing what you need, and being very beautiful and enjoyable. Ja, we wollen das in Kaktus gaan. Wir haben wieder mal mit der Kaktus weggeladen. Wir haben ein bisschen her, wo wir das nicht mehr verbringen. Ja, wo ich mir die Däume auf der Welt Platz sind, wir haben von den Affen. Und das ist, weil es ist hart, weil es sehr einfach ist, wenn wir es nicht haben. Weil sie nicht haben, dass sie nicht so viele Menschen sehr weit weg sind. Uh, another category of policies that support active transportation is the idea of multimodal active transportation, transit. The idea that your alternative to driving is not necessarily either walking or cycling or using the car. It's your ability to use all three of those things, maybe in combination as part of a particular trip or picking them individually as you need them to go to certain. Um, and so I've been studying uh, in that category, uh, the bike here system, um, uh, which has been uh, very popular. Um, uh, those are the those are the basic sort of overview of what the system is. And uh, I'll say quickly here that that uh, what I found. Uh, as a sort of organizing principle that really helps to explain the success of the system is that it's considered part of public transport. Uh, they put the emphasis on providing access, uh, both financially and physically, for as many people as possible, and are willing to subsidize and invest in it at a rate similar to uh, public transport. Uh, and as a result, it's achieved very high level of performance at the international level. Uh, this shows uh, essentially how intensely those bikes are used relative to uh, the top 30 uh, countries from an international sample of 75 countries. Uh, so this data, um, uh, basically the data, the, the study did not include talk to originally, I put it in there to see where it would, where it would fell in this experience. This I thought be interesting to share with you uh, as a Canadian uh, or as a Canadian model of living in Tokyo. Uh, an example of, of how, uh, or in Ottawa, I'd say, look, uh, we're being outperformed uh, badly here by Tokyo. Uh, in Ottawa, if you buy an L bus pass for 12 months, uh, it will cost you 1,506 Canadian dollars. Uh, and if you want to get bike share, you can't. Uh, in Tufto, an adult bus pass costs $203 Canadian, and then if you want to add bike share to it, uh, it costs $242.37. Uh, 
Yeah, so far not. Well, I'd say uh, I think you need to need to adjust your prices and expand your service. Um, last thing I'll say, uh, the, well, the, what I want to emphasize once again is public transport. The idea of bike shares public transport is, is uh, I think, very promising from a number of perspectives. Uh, but one of them, uh, I think, actually not so much in cities like Calgary, but in bigger cities. One of them is the idea of, of the com of combining public transport with uh, with bike share. Uh, typically, you would say that a major, let, let's say you had a metro uh, type system, you would typically say that the catchment area, the area that people that they'd expect a large number of people to access that station from is about a 15 minute walk away. So you have a certain relative, 15 minutes certain of the station. But you could potentially increase that theoretical catchment area dramatically if you have a uh, bike share, particularly the assist bike share like you have a can cover long, a much longer distance than those 15 minutes. And in the spread out cities, bigger cities, and spread out cities like you have in North America, I think that's potentially a very, uh, very valuable approach. Uh, another example is called uh, mobility as a service. Um, we're starting to have that kind of thing formally, informally. Uh, various types of apps you can use to help you use sustainable modes. Uh, and use them interchangeably in the you know in the classic sort of uh, academic model of mobility of service. Mobility of service. You say, well, I have a choice. I could either buy a car or I could pay a monthly fee to this mobility provider, who will then uh, give me access to scooters, shared cars, transit, bikes, uh, taxis, as I need it. Uh, and when I want to go somewhere, I put in the app. I want to go here. The provider says, "Okay, you know, walk two blocks, take this bus, walk three, get up to bike share," uh, and they just do it, and you don't pay any additional fees. Um, finally, and very importantly, there's a category of the distance centers to drive. Uh, and I think critically, we need these. Uh, maybe they have to come somewhat after the policy to make active and sustainable transportation easier because it's politically difficult to make the life of the driver difficult if you're not offering an alternative. But once the alternative is established, then you can do a lot of other things that basically make driving inconvenient. Um, low speed limits enforcement are actually part of that. Uh, transit priority, active transportation priority. Uh, but the big categories are probably parking. You can do a lot, limiting the amount of parking, making it more expensive, making it more difficult. Uh, road pricing, places like uh, London and Stockholm, maybe some of you have been there, they have basically when you, when you move in certain zones, you have to pay money to bring a car. Um, and also taxes, uh, like there are some, I think taxes are coming for uh, vehicles in Estonia, for example, this would be all the that transfer. Um, so lastly, um, political challenges. What I've tried to show so far is that essentially we know active transportation is a good idea for these reasons. We have ample, you know, for X and X reasons, we have ample evidence to show that it makes sense that I mean, it's good economically, it's good environmentally, it's good for health. There's no good reason not to do it. Second, we talked about policies. So we also have very good knowledge about what has to be done uh, in concrete terms to get it. We know that we need lower vehicle speeds. We know that we need uh, disincentives to car use. We know that we need better infrastructure. Uh, we know the places to do it to get results. But uh, at the same time, we see that it's not being, many places where it's not being done or it's being done in weakness. And um, the argument really is that, well, the reason this is not being done is it has to do with the political level. Um, but that shouldn't be a reason, I mean, but that shouldn't be a reason not to do it. It shouldn't be a point at which we say, oh, well, it's just impossible because we follow. I think there's a there's a reason for understanding what these political uh, challenges are, uh, and then and then working to to get past them. Um, so this is the point I just expressed, uh, elegantly expressed by uh, somebody else, uh, Melvin Deacon. 
who made this uh, article and uh, made this argument in an editorial saying that uh, we don't need any more theoretical uh, knowledge or planning knowledge. We need political will to do so. Um, uh, we need to provide more space for cycling at the cost of motorized traffic. Um, and then similarly, some other studies showing that, well, what's stopping us? Well, things like lack of political support, uh, you know, or challenges flowing. Uh, lack of political support. Um, so I, I was interested in those questions uh, when I was working on my PhD thesis. This is almost 10 years ago. Uh, so I compared the city of Ottawa and Helsinki from a political perspective. I was interested in why two similar cities had much different active transportation uh, success. Uh, so first of all, I picked the two because I thought in a lot of ways these are similar cities. They have similar size, similar urban population density, similar climate, similar topography, and actually uh, similar levels of car ownership in the countries in which those uh, those cities are. Uh, on the other hand, this is how I look from a modal split perspective. Uh, basically, if you look at this, all you need to concentrate is the, is the red. Uh, so in Ottawa, about 70, this was at the time, about 72% of trips in Ottawa were, were being made by car, and about only 23% else, despite these cities looking sort of similar. So I was wondering well, what's, what's the story? Why, why is it? Why has it turned out differently? Um, and then, well, at the, the policy level, you think, well, this is not surprising. But at one level, the reason Helsinki has more active transportation rates is because it has much better facility, uh, has more land, it has more, basically has more public transit and has more active transportation facilities. So not surprisingly, it has higher active transportation rates, but uh, how did they get there? What the, the political uh, advocates, there were political advocates, there were advocates in both of them must be working actively to promote active transportation. So I was looking at well, what happened, what did these advocates run into in Ottawa that they did not run into in Helsinki? Um, a couple of pictures here, this is just kind of, well, it's kind of fun just to give you an idea. But uh, Ottawa, if you, you know, want to show a little bit of the good and the bad, it looks like this. We have some nice active transportation facilities. Uh, green spaces along the river areas and so on. Uh, but also this is directly in the, the road, directly adjacent to the path. We also have the traffic backing up like this all. Uh, this is my research question. And uh, I, I did it by interviewing uh, a large number of experts in both cities and then doing a thematic analysis. What did you run into? There's obstacles in Helsinki. What did you run into? And there's obstacles in Ottawa. And when I'm talking about all of this, uh, essentially three major categories stood up. Helsinki had uh, better land use. Uh, they were working with better land use, and they also had a better system for, for ongoing land use planning. They had better traditions, like better, better traditions in transfer planning. Traditions that looked a little bit more like the more modern approach I discussed here, whereas Ottawa was working with traditions a bit more in the older school uh, And then there were a number of differences in the, in the political systems that made it uh, sort of exacerbated its problems as we're planning tradition and land use. Um, and I'll just talk about one of them here so you, uh, you can get the idea of what kind of uh, how politics situation. Um, in one city or another, how it can translate in a different way politically. Um, well, anyway, this is another way of expressing the same thing. Okay, let me see if I can speak that slide. But that's, that's Ottawa, the specific challenges in Ottawa, what, what it looked like. Um, but the one I want to talk about is this, this uh, has to do with land use and the kind of political division between the opinions of people who live in more spread out areas, people who live in the you know, tight ones. This is an article uh, I thought quite uh, some astute observations in uh, our national newspaper in Canada, pointing out that in Canada we've got these suburban areas, these low density suburban auto dependent areas. 
But because of the land use planning, these are growing uh, faster than the populations that are in our urban areas. Um, and their votes, uh, their votes matter. Their votes are starting to outnumber the votes of the people in the old inner city. Um, and basically, it's just saying that this has major political implications for our major political parties who are trying to decide whose votes to chase. Uh, and the more our, our country takes on a suburban approach, well, the more the political parties are actually chasing those votes and uh, supporting auto-oriented policies. Um, and in the recent election in Ottawa, uh, we saw this pandemic. We had one uh, candidate, Catherine McKenney, who uh, had pledged to build 25 years of cycling infrastructure, like what we had planned for 25 years to pledge to shorten it to one term. Um, and she had promised a uh, freeze on uh, public transport fees and free public transit for people under age 17. And uh, the other one who expressed these, uh, these kind of anti uh, active transportation sentiments. Uh, your classic uh, bike lanes aren't going to help you get to hockey practice. Um, okay, now I have to use a pointer here. Okay, this uh, this this white part here is a river that flows through uh, the Ottawa area, and the city of Ottawa is basically occupies this area south of the river. So you can kind of ignore the, the top part of the map first of all. Basically, this is showing the entire city of Ottawa uh, classified according to transportation patterns of the people who live in it. The darker in color, like in this area here, here we see very high rates of active transportation, uh, people who live there using the walking cycling trail. Uh, the, the yellow areas here are what this uh, scholar has classified as transit suburbs. So they're suburbs, but the suburbs that uh, Essentially, a transit works well and people use it quite a bit. So, a bit farther out, maybe not the worst situation in the world. And then this outside part in light yellow, this is the auto suburbs where basically everybody relies primarily on cars to get around. Um, so, yeah, bear, well, before we switch to the next one, bear in mind sort of what the city of Ottawa looks like in terms of, uh, in terms of transport behavior. And then this is how the election came out, a different scale. This is that same river there. Uh, and the the proactive transport, the active proactive transportation candidate, this is the areas that she won in purple. And then the areas in green were won by the uh, the anti-active transportation candidates. Um, so, point being, uh, the main point is that if uh, jurisdictions don't get a handle on, on making active transportation and sustainable transportation work in the outlying areas, they don't manage this. You have an ever increasing problem. You have more and more people living there, uh, and they're all driving. And they're all going to continue to support policies in favor of driving. Um, and they're going to have a number of people who live in the older, tighter inner areas, and they're going to basically mess up transportation for that group too, because they, they control, they vote about matters pertaining, at least in, in the auto area, they vote about matters pertaining to the organization of the whole city, including the airport. So it starts to become more highly preemptive too. Um, so that's essentially what I uh, what I had. I thought maybe, uh, well, okay, we we can try to think. Is anything worth talking about here? Well, you know, this this one for Ottawa. Uh, these were the kind of strategies that I came up with based on my research results. What could, if you're an active transportation advocate, one way or another, what could you potentially do? Uh, well, on the land you send, uh, you need to uh, basically perform the land use planning uh, regulatory framework. Uh, you need to uh, perhaps afford the idea that municipalities should purchase land and have control that way. 
from a transportation planning perspective, uh, I recognize how important it is that the manual of the training we have our engineers that this changes. Otherwise, we're fighting the battle over and over and over again with the, the, the technical people. And from a political point of view, uh, making sure that there's a dependable revenue for public transit from higher levels of government. Uh, and then emphasizing the suburbs in AT, not forgetting that we really need to bring transportation to those suburbs uh, if we want to have this much of success. Uh, yeah, no. So, uh, yeah, that maybe would be interesting. Um, interesting for you to see where Tatko is and where the plans are. Um, and, uh, you know, if you'd like as part of the discussion, you could, you could comment on this. Um, uh, basically, we have here, uh, this is from the current uh, bicycle strategy. This is the current situation right now. Uh, automobile transport at about 45%, uh, 45% uh, of trips by car. Uh, and then uh, a dark little walk, uh, and then uh, orange. Uh, bike and the green is those two basically put together uh, and this is where the city hopes to go and I think what's interesting maybe what's interesting is the the plans to 2040 uh, basically mean that uh, public transport and walking the idea would be to maintain them at the same level they are now and mainly get a decrease in car trips by increasing cycling trips. Um, if that were achieved, I would think that that's uh, quite impressive progress. Like say these are, personally, I say these are quite ambitious, ambitious targets. Um, yeah, I think uh, we can we can leave it there. If anybody wants to talk some more, perhaps we can meet in this place and uh, discuss it like that. Thank you, Carl. Very nice uh, overview and a lot of thoughts to think about further. And uh, you have on this audience some questions or comments to, to discuss with Carl. No questions, but I really, really like the comparison that you did with this political perspective uh, in the other yes. It's really, really nice. Good. Well, so they, it's the same case in Estonia. Yeah, I think you have my, my impression. Well, my impression is that uh, in some cases, maybe the, the urgency at the moment is a bit, you might say it's a bit less because like uh, Tokyo, for example, it's, it's basically the population is not growing. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas Canadian cities are expanding, like population is growing this rapid rate. And we don't have the right policies in place, so this growth is happening like crazy on the outside. Um, in some cases, it's more, more well organized than others. In some cases, we're making progress, but like historically, we've had this more people, more people, more people, and we just add them in low density <laughs> housing at the outside. And talk to, I know that there's uh, you know the wrong kind of suburbanization happening on these municipalities at the outskirts, but. Because the population growth hasn't been as strong, we don't have it anywhere near the same scale. But it could. Those municipalities are the different ones. They are not the inhabitants of Tartu. So yes. people in Tartu can decide what is best for them. But yes. for example, yes. uh, in some municipalities, after uh, we have created new general plans, some villages outside of what now is the city will be a part of yes. the city. So yes. in this sense, uh, these yes. uh, borders can change. Yeah, this is a very interesting thing to consider. Like in in Ottawa, um, didn't explain all this, but in Ottawa, those those major areas outside the city, at one point they were separate municipalities. And the one thing that came out in the in the research was effectively the situation for active transportation got worse. When the tsunami happened, as soon as that happened, 
uh, certainly uh, the policies that you know, used to be uh, popular when people living in the old city of Ottawa suddenly were not so popular because they're out of number, but people living on the outside. On the other hand, if you really did have uh, maybe the right regulatory framework in place and you had uh, governments that were committed, there is this possibility of, of, of stronger coordination, uh, you know, organizing the whole region uh, in such a way that it works. And there's room for it to grow, but it grows in sensible uh, kind of way. Uh, on the map that you showed about Ottawa, there was um, and and those zones, there was urban core, mm -hmm. and there was this like periphery, carbon periphery, and then the transit zone. Yeah. So I noticed that that the transit zone uh, was was uh, there only in the southern part of the of the city area. So in the Ottawa area, because the northern part actually belongs to another, it belongs to Quebec, doesn't it? So yeah, there is also an administrative border in between. So whether Quebec's uh, policies have not uh, introduce public or, or support public transit uh, enough? Or yeah, like I think, uh, well, first of all, I mean, I can talk, I, I, I won't talk much of the research because in my research, I sort of drew a line in there and decided I'm not doing so. Yeah. <laughs> but the other side, um, but uh, effectively, uh, so one of the things that made Ottawa interesting was that it did make a deliberate effort starting in the 1960s in the 1970s. There was this problem recognized of increasing automobility. There were progressive types arguing for the right thing. There were a number of major uh, highway plans that were canceled as a result of advocacy efforts. And in the 1970s, they um, started uh, planning uh, what became quite a, a well famous uh, bus rapid transit network. Uh, so this is like where we have bus, basically roads that are only for buses. Uh, it's not that they're not shared with other vehicles, but it's basically like a, a rail line except bus and drive line. And that system has been successful, and I think you can see evidence that well, that system works well in some parts of the city. You can get on a bus and drive very fast into the city, even though we don't have. We didn't have, and this is what we now have, have the beginnings of a, a light rail system. But this map dates from when uh, those figures would have basically been influenced by this bus rapid transit system. Whereas Gatineau is, well, it's a much smaller place and it doesn't have, it has a, a bus system and it's, it's okay by the North American standards, but it's not, not like that auto bus rapid transit thing. You'll find it in uh, transportation planning textbooks as an example of a uh, promising uh, technology for some place. But thanks, but on, on those lines about those rapid transit networks uh, versus low speed transit networks. Yeah. So so there are like in, in that sense two kind of systems, uh, whether you have separated space for this rapid transit, yeah. these rail systems and people cannot cross over and they have to be somehow separated or it's like more like a multi-use urban space and with low speed uh, transit, like right. 25 kilometers per hour for, for uh, tram lines, for example. Yeah. And, and it makes the, you know, the urban functioning more livable yes. and safe. Yeah. So what is your take on this discussion? Boy, that's a question that I haven't, I confess, I haven't given a huge amount of thought to. Um, I think that in many cases, um, well, I think inversely, there's a, there's a balance between, you know, beyond a certain distance, you'll lose ridership policy if, you, if, the, if the ride is slow and long, mm. people just won't take it. Uh, but on the other hand, like you said, uh, you don't you don't want to sort of ruin your uh, your inner city environment with creating all sorts of barriers for people. And there's also the the, uh, the argument that some have made that that will um, well. We're, for example, building a really expensive metro just to make life easier for the cars to drive on top. <laughs> uh, and you know, that doesn't necessarily make sense either. But I guess, yeah, I guess I don't have a, I don't have a clear, I don't have a clear answer to that. I don't understand. I think 
there are there are uh, circumstances where the high speed stuff makes sense. Yeah. But uh, you want to make sure that you are not using it in such a way that you are encouraging automobile traffic and it's used for, the, for that purpose to get the pedestrians off the street so we can drive. Um, or doing it in such a way that, yeah, you're, you're making life difficult for pedestrians mm -hmm. on the street in, in the area where you'd expect it to be. Yeah, exactly. So, so the space considerations are always also yeah. there. So first the, the functionality and where are these systems yeah. are but also the space. We always don't have space to, to introduce pedestrian lines, bike lines, uh, right. transit lines, car lines. Like And sometimes in certain uh, circumstances and uh, in case of certain traffic intensity, we also need to uh, implement multi-use yeah. Uh, streets. Yeah. So uh, perhaps that that could also be. Yeah. Like, it, it's it's not always separation, yeah. but sometimes it's multi-use, which also brings down the speed. Yeah, another, yeah, another slide I can show is I guess there is this kind of uh, classic uh, upside down pyramid for uh, planning urban environments, and I think that's a good starting point. Know, once you once you're in the kind of mixed urban area and you're planning a street, well, of course you have different priorities you have to jump. With. But from a planning perspective, you think, okay, first we make sure the pedestrians. Are Second, we make sure the bikes move. Third, we make sure the public transit. Fourth, we make sure the cars move, and then you do your planning based on that kind of um, that kind of. We, we have a very peculiar example from Tallinn from the recent times. So, so we're in, in the city core, like in the old town, there is space dedicated to best pedestrians. Yeah. So it's the pedestrian space by law, yeah. like, and, and the car's maximum speed for cars is 20 kilometers right. per hour. And in the vicinity of pedestrian, it's five kilometers per hour. And now the city, city municipality introduced pollers to separate pedestrians from cars so that the cars can still <laughs> Right in the, in the middle of this pedestrian space, so which is pretty much yeah. No, I think yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's really positive. All my inclination to be there to have uh, basically the cars are allowed to move them very at pedestrian speed and with the pedestrians have forever. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. But this is yeah, this is where the, the the politics and the old ways of urban planning is that we're still working against those, even though we know we know that. But perhaps it's then also that we haven't implemented all those principles into into the tube of decision making, right. it, into like different administrative units yeah. who, are, who are in charge of yeah. different levels of processes. Yeah. Yeah. If I may, you you mentioned that we do have a clear evidence why to use active public transport, active transportation. Yeah. Yeah. Like a lot of research on yeah. that, many groups. Yeah. But other thing is the policy. Yeah, or political yeah. approach. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. I think there is one more, one more aspect. What I can see, at least in my country, in yeah. the Republic, yeah. that people are lazy. Yes, and uh, they have their kind, their their, their own mindsets, like yes. that the car is still taken as a, as a symbol of yes. power. Yes, that I'm rich and I can afford to drive the car. Yes. so for I would say I'm not sure how big this group is, mm -hmm. but definitely they are very loud, very loud yes. in the public space. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And their approach is okay. There are there are some events, but I just want to drive my yeah. car. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 And this is I think very hard to elaborate it. Yeah. Very hard to research this issue. Yeah. It's not so easy. Yeah. So no, no, what, what's no. your idea about that? It's not. Um, I mean, one interesting. Uh, yeah, an interesting uh, thing I wasn't able to discuss earlier is that typically you find the, uh, in, in places where the active transportation rates are very high. When you ask people why they're doing this, well, why did you choose to bike or walk today? They don't say, well, this was good for my health, or uh, I, I did this because I believe it's good for the environment. They say things like, well, it only makes sense. Uh, it's the cheapest. I get some fresh air. It's super nice walking out here in the city. Um, and there was also, like, for, for a long time, uh, I, I used to be in uh, public health, basically. Uh, there was always this uh, repeating this, this saying, make the healthy choice the easy choice. 
And you know, ultimately, I think, it, yeah, it amounts to that. It's, it's maybe for the, for the decision makers, you know, we need to make these kind of technical arguments. Uh, you need to kind of prove these, you need to have science, you need to have these studies showing that the intuitive thing we all know is true is. <laughs> but then, uh, in terms of getting public support, uh, and this was actually one of my one of my conclusions from the Helsinki Ottawa study in a sort of indirect way. Getting this political support has more to do with selling the connecting at the kind of angle of, of livability and convenience that you know, if you're doing a public marketing campaign, uh, do it more about sort of feelings of freedom, feelings of uh, being out in green space, fresh air, moving easily in the city, and not sitting there in traffic. That's the mm -hmm. I think that's uh, you know, and then slowly you can hope to make it. In, you can hope to make it uh, fashionable, trendy thing. And not, or I think we're starting to see like evidence of that among younger generations. Like, there are large numbers of kids that just think it's not cool to be driving. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe we have to keep going and be patient. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, one more, one more thing which is related to that. Uh, again, the policy. Uh, in my city, the local government changed last year. There were a new election. Mm -hmm. And finally, after maybe 10 years of huge debate, mm -hmm. uh, there is a new leader party, in the city council. Mm -hmm. And they are really for very much into active transportation. Yes. And they started to do a certain number of, uh, of steps. Yeah. And one of them is to start with a new parking policy. Yes. Yeah, we did for them some kind of research to elaborate how people, how yes. citizens yeah. behave in sense of parking. Yeah. And they started to do a certain steps. Yeah. But it seems that they will not be elected anymore. Right. 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 Because yeah. it's resulted to some steps that are not so popular yeah. for majority of people. Like they, they say in Ottawa, the ones that you know had had achieved a certain amount of success. I said this is all about like you go push to get resistance and you back off. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. the person back off. You, you have to sort of be flexible that way and hope, hope you're making uh, mm -hmm. because you can get this, yeah. this reaction against it. Yeah, okay, thanks. So just for the different different groups of citizens, like whom policies should be targeted at. So you, so of course the, the car drivers, uh, so why are they driving the cars? So for personal benefits for taking their kids. So like just think that how to um, make up the communication and, and how to also design the measures that would take people away then from cars or put people to use active modes. There are other uh, other population groups as well. So, for example, senior people yeah. or people with walking disabilities. Yeah. So, so all these like different types of mobility aid yeah. users, like rollators, or or people with small kids who are using carriages, baby carriages or baby strollers. Yeah. So, um, so that there need to be also these kind of maintenance aspects throughout the seasons, throughout yeah. the year, yeah. that enabling people with these kind of mobility aids or carriage carriages yeah. to walk and to get on the transit. Yeah. So, have you somehow like checked also or included those groups also into your analysis? Well, I would just say that uh, like I didn't do anything you know, special in terms of uh, looking at specific groups in the model of healthy, but I would say that I mean it's very much um, appreciated. I think you know the people who are really planning these facilities and who are in the progressive plan to run the ball, they do appreciate all the differences. And that's where you have these terms like all ages and ability mm -hmm. to recognize that. Well, at first we thought we were making progress because we had this designated space on the road with paint on it saying that the bike can ride here. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that well, if you have 5,000 cars a day moving down the street and uh, 60 kilometers an hour, and there's a certain there's a certain type of uh, of cyclists who will be happy that finally they have their own space. But for another group, you have not crossed the threshold that will allow them to feel like I can go. Um, and that's why they're moving to this, this kind of all ages and abilities idea that well, no, like realistically, to get somebody who does not ride a bike right now to think they're going to do it, 
It's has to be not the least bit frightening. Uh, it has to be comfortable, it has to be convenient, it has to be pleasant. We need to build something that will attract them, those people who work for those people. Um, yeah, and uh, I mean, it's nice to see, for example, um, I think, I think, and that's another key thing, it's a natural sort of, we're getting, we're getting more sophisticated. At first, bike lanes were progressive. Now it's got to be much more than that. Now you see, like, you know, on my street here, you talked about this, this uh, uh, since I was here, it's been a renovation of the street. I've been looking at the other day. And, oh my God, it's really nice. And all the animals, like they, they're wide and stuff. So easier to push in the stroller or you've got the kids with you. And the sidewalks are wider than those. The lighting has been improved. You don't see well like walking there at night. Uh, it's easier. Uh, easier to maintain sidewalks wide. They've incorporated some greenery. Uh, in an area where they're also narrowing the intersection to slow the traffic. Uh, there's also a bike. They also have the, uh, I don't know what they're called exactly, but they have the uh, texture uh, panels at the crosswalk so that blind people can feel where they're going. Um, Elevated. Yeah, so all the crosswalks themselves are raised as well. So you're not going down and back up. Uh, so for me, it's evidence that. This, so we're getting yeah, increasingly sophisticated the approaches that we're thinking about all, all the time. Yeah. But not everyone's doing it. But as you can find terrible skills as well. Yeah, so we're getting more sophisticated. Yeah. 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 Aspects to discuss. I, I really like your this overview about this uh, policies which support this active mobility. It usually said that what is uh, bad for cars or what is have resistance, but what we can do more. But then I had the question that did you have this on this um, order of uh, influence or or you had just a random order or how you uh, think that which of these policies are more influencing to to change the environment or to get more for people to use active uh, ways yeah. of movement um, or they are no, very I mixed didn't, I, I didn't put, I, you know, they may have uh, they put accidentally put an order based on my you know, unconscious <laughs> um, my unconscious ordering like what, what did I think of first mm -hmm. and I put it there but and I, I haven't seen, I'm not saying it's not true, but I haven't seen them uh, ranked in order of priority. Um, I guess one comment I would make is that, you know, some of these policies are more or less prerequisites. Like, if, if you don't have the right infrastructure, um, you can't get very far with, uh, let's say, a public. I didn't talk about, but you can do, you know, public education campaigns, help you, you know, marketing and so on. You can't very well, let's say, start a, uh, you know, a great program. Let's get all the kids back in school if there isn't a safe place for them to arrive first. Uh, so I think you have to think a little bit that way. That there are things that that we absolutely have to have. You can't have, uh, you can't expect to promote cycling if uh, you either need the street to have low traffic and low speed limits, and we know what those kind of thresholds are. We need X many, if traffic is above X many thousand per day, uh, and the speed limit is below this, then people can ride in this traffic. But as soon as it's above that, they have to be separated. If they're not, then we have yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah, but I, yeah, I mean, they're all land use, for example, like I said, if it's too far, but we'll, we'll do it mm. uh, But, I, you know, I'll make one more thing in the order, kind of like the one thing I think I had more or less said is that politically, uh, there's maybe a logic to improving the conditions for active and sustainable transportation before you really get serious about congestion charges, parking policies, uh, you know, or at least showing that you're kind of doing both at the same time. You know, mm -hmm. All that we're, uh, we're increasing parking fees, we're building bike lanes, and we're reducing the public transit fee by mm -hmm. 
this function. And then you can kind of sell the get meter. Mm -hmm. right. Try to go right away with like a congestion chart, but you don't have good transit, you don't have good bike lanes in order. Yeah. I really like your this idea that uh, all the politicians uh, know what to do, but they yeah. don't. Uh, the gap between the knowledge and the real behavior, and I think this is the same for the individual people. They know that they have to move more, be more active, yeah. but if uh, they do the decisions that they take a car, then yeah. it's like uh, uh, they don't behave the same way. And then it's the questions that when it's um, or which of these policies have the uh, the least opposition of changing this uh, environment that they uh, step small step by step uh, move to more this active yes. uh, yeah but but which would be this policies to have have you thought about this well, or you find the for example some of these policies where where people say look this is a great policy because you you're not taking anything away from it. Yeah. You're adding in the service of the city and basically inconvenience to no one. Uh, so that's maybe the kind of policy that's a good one to start um, you know, and sort of getting involved in the thing we're building. Uh, I mean, you can get to people can some places are sometimes criticized for this, you know, by building bicycle infrastructure where it's easy to build it. But maybe at the start, it's going to get going that way. Uh, then we move in the direction of where you actually need to take a lane away from traffic. Uh, after you've got bikes piling up, coming in on the roof of the outskirts, you say, well, look, we have all these bikes there. <laughs> where do we put them? Mm. Yeah, I also thought that one is the infrastructure of that people can use it, but in another way, it is also that if you see everywhere, but that there is a lot of bikes and then it's uh, can have also the uh, change of thinking to that sure. they can do it. Maybe yeah. I also can do it, or then it's a uh, very popular on this uh, well, then, way uh, to be. Again, bike sharing or common best practice or you know, best practice advice, but think very carefully about how you do the launch. So that when it starts, you have lots of people using it right away. And so that other people see, oh, look, they started that bike sharing thing. I see all kinds of people using it. I need to try it. Because if you start it quietly and nobody sees anybody else, and it's just like uh, some weird thing that mm -hmm. it doesn't work. So. Yeah, it doesn't bring the social uh, social change that is uh, needed in or yeah. the social norms. Uh, yeah, it won't change so much. And, and I think well, that like facilities too, like this feeling that you build a facility, like it can't just be. The more nice it is and appealing is, the more that someone driving by and thinking, that looks nice. I can see myself riding a bike there. I, I enjoy that. Then you have chat. And, and this actually uh, drives also the consumer demand. So the, there is more social demand for new infrastructure, yeah. new services. And sometimes politicians might also like stop on that uh, page that, OK, we implemented this nice bike system, which didn't um, insult anyone, yeah. it didn't take anything away from anyone. We also reconstructed these two nice streets and that's it. Sometimes it's that, OK, we have already this kind of, you know, uh, these wins and and we just show those wins and we don't move forward yeah. because they they perhaps are you know afraid of uh, right. the the obstacles or the protests which which will come after us. But right. but now when also the social demand changes, yeah. they can't stop any yeah. anymore on the top yeah. of the way. Yeah, they have. Okay, this is one last thing about the bike shift. It was also came out in my research in both Nelson Gate Doctor that people said that the the bike share, the arrival of bike share in these cities appears to be translating into more public pressure for improving the infrastructure, just like you said. And we have more people riding, uh, people who weren't riding before, and they don't feel like this infrastructure is safe enough. I mean, the pedestrians may be you know, upset that uh, some of these people are riding on the sidewalk, which is a good problem, to, but it is a good problem to have more political pressure to build better infrastructure. Time is running fast and we have to finish this lecture today. Thank you, Carl, very much for this discussion and the uh, previous lecture. And uh, for ending of this uh, lecture series, said that uh, I think we have uh, had a very interesting uh, people here and uh, talking about the mobility and planning issues and, and a lot of discussions. 
And if you've missed some lectures or would like to listen again, then all the lectures of the lecture series uh, for this year and also from last year are available on the lecture series website, transportplanning.ut.de. And I hope you enjoyed our, our lectures and uh, have got many uh, thoughts about mobility and planning. And uh, the next lecture we come next year and see you soon. Thank you.